Welcome to Bible Track Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracks, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracks Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracks and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracks will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Greetings to you, my friend. Welcome to the Thursday edition of Bible Track Echoes. My Bible is sitting open to the book of Leviticus. Yes, Leviticus. We have begun this week a study in the book of Leviticus. We're studying it one chapter at a time. At least that will be our basic plan. And right now, my Bible is open to Leviticus chapter 2. Please, if at all possible, reach over, pick up your own copy of the Word of God, and open it to Leviticus chapter 2. My title for this chapter is this, Cooking for Christ. Cooking for Christ. You'll see why I give it that title here in just a moment. I've got a gospel tract in my hand entitled, What About Eternal Life? I want to encourage you to get tracts from us here in a moment, but let me lead into the broadcast this way. As a group of people, farmers tend to be the the group most keenly aware that there is a God and that he controls the world. Now, I'm not saying that all farmers are Christians. We all know that that's not true. Farmers, though, are, are utterly dependent upon the weather, and they're dependent upon the process of seeds sprouting and plants growing. Both processes there are out of the farmer's control. So farmers, as a group, are keenly alert to the miracle of plant life and the mysteries of weather. At harvest time, farmers know in the depth of their soul two things. One, farming is hard work, and that work had to be done. Number two, they know that without God's help, all that hard work would have been for absolutely nothing. Here in Leviticus 2, we find an offering that reminds us all that God is the ultimate provider of all of our our needs. Join me in Leviticus, please, in chapter 2. Before I begin to read at verse 1 there, let me just encourage you with the fact of getting some gospel tracts from us. You see, the radio program, Bible Tract Echoes, we've been going since 1957, but this is the radio arm of a ministry called Bible Tracts Incorporated, and that is has been going on since 1938. We're in our 80th year of publishing gospel tracts in different languages and giving them away around the world. I, I want to put a sample packet of our tracts into your hands. I want to do that at the end of the broadcast. My announcer will give you three ways by which you can give to us your name and mailing address. One of the tracts in the sample packet is entitled, What About Eternal Life? What about eternal life? Part of the track says this, as an old man with whom I was dealing said to me once, I'm afraid, I'm afraid my bad deeds are going to outweigh my good deeds. I said, mister, if your good deeds had outweighed your bad deeds, you wouldn't have the slightest chance of getting into heaven. Well, that startled the man. He looked at me in utter amazement. He thought if his good deeds outweighed his bad deeds, all would be well. Multiplied thousands believe the same thing. He thought he could earn or buy or merit eternal life by his goodness. After I showed him that salvation is a gift, he bowed his head and received Jesus Christ as Savior. My friend, do you know that uh, the word eternal life does not mean eternal existence? Are you aware of that? You see, eternal existence is going to be had by all, including the devil and demons and so on. They're going to exist forever, but not in heaven. They're going to be in hell. To have eternal life, you need to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. This gospel track really makes that clear. Oh, please let me send you this track as part of that sample packet. If you can't wait to the end of the broadcast and hear my announcer's uh, ways of giving us your name and address, just please go to our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Give us your name and address. We'll be glad, free of charge, to send that sample packet to you. 
Well, if your Bible's open to Leviticus chapter 2, I begin reading at verse 1, and here is what the Bible says. And when any will offer a meat, or really the word is meal offering, their grain offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's son, the priest, and he shall take thereout a handful of the flour thereof and the oil thereof and all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial, that is the part of it, upon the altar to be an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the remnant, the leftover of that oil and the flour, the remnant of the meal offering shall be Aaron's and the sons. It's a thing most holy of an offering unto the Lord made by fire. Now, I want to uh, take you to verse 11, which says this, No meat, or that is a meal offering, which you shall bring unto the Lord, shall be made with leaven, for ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey, in any offering of the Lord made by fire. If we go back, you're going to find the word baked there in verse 4, baked in verse 5, and baked in verse 7. The one who brings the offering could do some cooking for his Lord. Well, as you come to Leviticus chapter 2, the meal offering or the grain offering here is before us. It is a bloodless offering. It's made unto the Lord. So being bloodless, no blood, then obviously this offering has nothing to do with making an offering for sin. The meal offering was not a mandatory action. It was a voluntary action. But the statement it made is really critical, and it says a lot about the heart of the person who brought the offering. I'm going to use some I words today. The first one is intent. The in, what is the intent of this offering? In Leviticus chapter 1, we saw the burnt offering. It pictured the total dedication or consecration of the offerer to God. It's a picture of what you and I might call Romans 12, 1 and 2 being a living sacrifice. Now, in chapter 2 of Leviticus, the meal offering is a statement of acknowledgement. It acknowledges that all that I have has come from God. That's the intent. What about my second I word? It's the word ingredients. Ingredients. There were only three ingredients in this meal offering. There was the fine flour, the oil, and the frankincense. All three of these came as a result of human effort. That's different than the burnt offering. These three are a result of human effort. The flour had to be obviously grown. The grain had to be grown and then crushed to flour. That's human work. The oil had to be squeezed out of its original source. That's human work. And the frankincense had to be crushed from the galbanum plant. That's human work. So human work went into the process here of this offering. The offerer was saying, by bringing these things, they were acknowledging this, God, you are the supplier of my needs. Yes, I worked, but if you had not given me the strength and given me these plants and made them grow, I would have nothing at all to feed my family. King David understood this offering very, very well. Sometime go over to First Chronicles chapter 29, begin reading about verse 10 in there, but let me read you a part of verse 12 and verse 14. David said, First Chronicles 29 verse 12, it says this, and I'm quoting now, both riches and honor come from thee, from God, and thou reignest over all. In thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Verse 14 says, for all things come from thee, end quote. Now, that is the intent of the offering. That is the ingredients in the offering. So, if you're jotting down notes, you've seen the intent, you've seen the ingredients. Now, let me come to this part, the insight. The insight based upon this offering. Beloved, listen, every one of these sacrifices here, every one of them that in chapters one through seven pictures Jesus Christ, when it comes to every spiritual blessing and gift, all of them come through Jesus Christ. Here in the meal offering, the three ingredients tell us about Jesus and they picture him. First of all, the fine flour, it points to the 
purity and the perfection of Jesus. Jesus was born of a virgin. There was no man involved. It was a miraculous birth so that Jesus had no sinful human nature. He was not a sinner. He had a human nature, but not a sinful human nature. So the fine flower points to his perfection, his purity, and his human life. Here in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 11, I read it a moment ago, there were told there that no leaven or no honey could be included. Both of those things promoted fermentation and corruption. Those are things that bring detriment and deadness. Jesus had no corruption. Jesus had no sin. Jesus had no deadness. When he died on the cross, he gave up his life. He surrendered his life willingly. That's the fine flower. The oil points to the Holy Spirit. Sometime go to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. There we're told that God the Father anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. Jesus was God in human flesh, but he chose to do his work under the control of the third member of the Trinity, the Spirit. And by the way, that's how you and I do our lives as believers, to the enabling of the indwelling Spirit. The third ingredient was the frankincense. This was a very fragrant spice, which really only gave off its smell when it was put with fire. Frankincense is a symbol of prayer and communion and fellowship. How in the world does this spice picture Jesus? Well, friend, Jesus was put through the fire of testing, and finally the great fire of all was the crucifixion. Yet through it all, what did he do? He prayed. His strength physically to do the work of being our Savior came as a result of praying to the Father. No greater episode of this can be found in all the Word of God than when we find Christ there in the Garden of Gethsemane. His words not my will, but thine be done. It's a surrender. And he goes to the Calvary in the enabling help of God's spirit. Those words, not my will, but thine be done, have echoed down through the centuries, all as a result of Christ going first in prayer. Now, listen, dear listener friend, if you are a believer like I am, then you and I have a task to do just as Jesus did. To do our task, we will need the enabling strength of the Holy Spirit and we'll need prayer. Without God's help, we can do what? We can do absolutely nothing. Also, believer friend, we need to acknowledge God's sovereign hand in providing us all that we have. Every good gift comes from above. We get it from God. And the attitude of gratefulness ought to be a a prominent trait of our lives. But if you're listening today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you've not been born again, please note these very truthful things. Number one, the way into God's presence to even offer him a gift is only available through the person of his son, Jesus, through the purity of Jesus. And he could be your sin bearer if you let him. He stands ready to be that. The empty tomb of Jesus proves that his offering on Calvary was enough to pay for all of your sins. The Bible says this, Jesus arose for our justification. Let him be the one who makes you right with God today. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.